Well, welcome everyone uh, to the uh, second of our general orientation sessions for the 2021 ARA virtual annual meeting. I am Felice Levine, uh, your executive director, if you're a member, and your executive director, at least from the vantage of our annual meeting, and I hope our collective commitment to advancing our field and the next generations of those coming into the field. Uh, we are here to serve and not only to introduce our virtual annual meeting, but to know that we together are working in a collaborative way to make uh, for your success. We've had quite a large number of sessions, including two last week. This is the fourth this week. Those that have come before this one are already on the ARA website and, they, and there are recordings available. There are uh, fact sheets available and more will be posted early in the week. Uh, the purpose of this general orientation is to give you, I suppose, uh, uh, 90 minutes around the world here of what our platform is, uh, how you will use it, how you're going to be supported. And what I mean by that is not a function of the complexity of the uh, uh, platform, but actually the one-stop shopping and all you can do in this, uh, in this environment that you will enter together. And, and the purpose of the general orientation is to give you a sense of its functionality the ease of its use. You do not need to have URLs in your memory and in your uh, phones or uh, on other electronic equipment. You are essentially entering a community. Um, a, uh, uh, I think of it as an island together uh, from February 8th and with pre-meeting, I'm sorry, uh, April 8th and with pre-meeting starting on April 5th through the 12th followed by uh, four days of professional uh, uh, development courses, one each day for those interested in our mini courses. Uh, before we start, I want to say what I think you've probably observed already. Each of our meetings, any of the meetings that we do in a public space or of any size and significance, uh, whether it was the meeting that we held uh, for SIG chairs, we include um, um, ASL. And so I want to say hello to Jamie, who is sharing the screen with me, and Kabowski, who will be joining us as they share uh, ASL interpretation together in a roughly 20 minute uh, handoff with each other. And Renee, who is doing a live closed captioning. For those of you who want to be able to read the transcription and zoom you go to the live transcript and you will be able to see the live um, uh, closed captioning. Um, I am broadcasting without a screen. I am broadcasting from my living room. Uh, we remain distant at the American Educational Research Association headquarters, uh, although sometimes on a floor uh, by myself uh, we broadcast um, from there, as we will do for um, a number of the uh, uh, virtual annual meeting uh, activities. I think the main emphasis today I have set forth, uh, I could stop and entertain general questions, but I really want to emphasize what's available to you already. And that is that we have, uh, we held a session yesterday for anyone in and a, and a role in a session, whether you're chairing a session, presenting a paper, uh, if, it's a, if it's a session with a discussant uh, or a commentator, uh, we, have, we had that one session yesterday. The Monday session is really dedicated to the um, presentation role. But the main thing I want to emphasize is how easy and user friendly it is. Many of you have worked in other platforms. Many of you are teaching uh, uh, or taking courses and you've experienced one platform or another, whether it's Zoom or WebEx. When you're doing that work as a presenter, uh, 
the experience for you is, I will say, as easy, if not easier, because you will not have to hunt and seek to get to a session. You are essentially in a community once you essentially have one spot sign in uh, with a password. And the, and the orientation today, through the group that we are collaborating with in the, in the creation of this platform for you and for all of our attendees, this destination um, uh, provides you with many, many opportunities from informal social networking that you can implement on your own to any attendee if you want to uh, catch up with a, uh, um, a former uh, colleague or student that's in the platform at that time, you will be able to, within the platform, send a chat and say, let's get together in two hours and have a cup of coffee together. That can be a text chat or you yourselves within the platform without scheduling another meeting uh, can also have a, a video chat. We've designed the meeting. Many of you know that uh, the classical ARA annual meeting has had two hour blocks for certain sessions. All of the sessions are an hour and a half blocks for papers, uh, paper sessions and symposia. Round tables and poster sessions are an hour block and we've created a one hour block also for um, special sessions that have less things concurrent like some of our prominent lectures and indeed the presidential address that our president Sean Harper will be delivering. He will be delivering that on day five in that one hour ban. By virtue of creating uh, um, some differences in how we use the annual meeting time, there is much more time for break time. So in the, in the, uh, in the East Coast morning, which we recognize around the world is not East Coast morning uh, or necessarily even the same day, there's, there starts with a kind of a half hour a coffee time. Uh, then there are, uh, then there's a series of one hour sessions for poster sessions and round tables, then leading to an hour and a half block. And then there is the one hour band for, um, uh, for any number of sessions that really are substantive, but take essentially uh, one hour would be um, totally sufficient with one featured speaker or a great debate. Then there's a break time, but we consider it to be a social networking time. There will be opportunities to, uh, I think the graduate, uh, graduate student council is on uh, day two, three, and four. They will have a networking space for uh, for for uh, graduate students to join in and come to essentially come to a room for networking. There will be many others during that span. And then the afternoon unfolds. So from the very way we've designed the meeting to how you will now be introduced to the platform, it is really with um, an aspiration of creating as much as one can. We all look forward to 2022 and the San Diego place-based meeting, but as much as we can, a sensitivity to the human kinds of qualities that we expect, the networking, the informal exchange, the hanging out that we both, um, that we value uh, in uh, annual meeting, as well as the, of course, wonderful um, uh, substantive sessions that are the hallmark of the AERA annual meeting. So with that kind of brief orientation, I would like to introduce our SCARET group. That is the um, virtual platform that we selected from well over three dozen. This is a group that has been doing virtual meetings for over 12 years. It is a secure environment that we enter together. I, you know, whether you think of it as an island that we're coming to together or a satellite or a convention center. I like the other analogs a little bit more because it's uh, actually a warmer kind of place than, uh, than just moving into a building. And you will, you'll be introduced to that, uh, the features of that and, and, um, and, and how to think about um, really what the opportunity will be for you when you sign on, uh, sign on and, and join with us. 
We also have and, and are increasingly not only expanding our disability services, but increasingly attentive this, I say, every year, this century, to what it means to be um, inclusive of those with diverse forms of disabilities, as well as more generally um, to uh, embrace what we mean as a field and how we seek to lead as a field in, uh, in inclusive practices. Uh, for this meeting and moving forward, we've, we have benefited from a special consultant, Emily Biddix, who will be also talking about accessibility in each of these sessions so that we begin to internalize not what it means just to have needs for accessibility services of one form or another, but at what it means to be part of a community where that is a primary commitment and agenda. AERA introduced an ombuds program in 2019. That will also be a place where one can seek, be a sounding board, seek advice, seek advi uh, uh, guidance, totally independently from the ARA apparatus and structure or any of your departments, institutions, colleagues. It's really a confidential location to raise any issues uh, that, that are important to you as you uh, navigate the meeting. And with that uh, kind of broad brush stroke, hopefully an impressionistic sense of um, of what we're offering and we hope what's exciting and engaging and satisfying to all of you. Uh, let me turn this over to our colleagues in the Scarrick group. Uh, Rachel. Thank you, Felice. Hi everybody, thanks for joining today. My name is Rachel and I'm with the meeting planning company Scarrick group. I will be assisting to put on this year's virtual conference. I'm going to share my screen so we can walk everyone through a few key features. All right, so on the screen, I have the login page. In the center of the screen is going to be a place where you can add your email and password. This login information is going to be sent out to each of the people that register for the conference. It will include the date that you can enter the platform as well. So be on the lookout for that email. It's very important that every individual registers for this conference separately. You will not be able to share login information. Once you log into the platform, we're going to be on a landing page with a few tiles of information that AERA will populate with either important information regarding the association as a whole or specifically the conference. The bottom center tile will allow you to enter into our virtual lobby. The lobby looks like a hotel lobby and there is opportunities for sponsorship throughout. We're going to focus on a few key areas for the sake of this call to try to highlight what we believe to be the most important information going into the conference. The first thing I'd like to point out is in the bottom navigation toolbar, there are several icons down here, but the first one we will focus on is the one called map. The map is going to open a screen with several different pins. Each pin is going to represent a different room in the virtual conference center. In the top toolbar, this top toolbar will be in every room in the platform as well. And we're going to focus on a few of the tabs starting with today's events. Today's events is going to be where you can access every live session during the conference. When you see a blue play button to the left of the title, that will signify that <clears throat> the session is open and you are able to attend. You can also add specific events to your schedule if you would like to condense how many sessions show up at once. You'll be able to log in before the conference begins so you can use that time as an opportunity to build your schedule. To do so, you'll click on upcoming events and there will be all the sessions listed with an icon that says add next to it. 
and those will all populate in my schedule. There's also a tab titled announcements in the top toolbar. We recommend checking here daily for any announcements that ADRA is going to share with you. Some of these will click out to another page, play a video, or go to another website. So these will change daily. But we'll move back down to the bottom toolbar to go over a few additional icons. One of them is titled chat. Every room in the virtual conference center is going to have this icon. And this icon is used as a public group chat. So if you ever need to chat with other attendees or reach out for assistance, you can do so here. You also have the opportunity to start phone calls or video calls in addition to the text chat feature. Those icons are in the shape of a video camera or a phone, and they'll be located in the top header of the chat window. If you're in a group chat setting and you click on one of these or another attendee clicks on one, it will generate a link that says click here to join the conversation. And that is how you will be able to interact with other attendees via phone or video. There's also going to be a help icon in the bottom toolbar, which will include a lot of information that may answer some of your questions while you're navigating through the platform. There will be several people on standby to support you with any questions you may have. I'm going to go back into the map now and show you a few different pins or rooms in the virtual conference center. The first one we'll open is the presentation gallery, and that pin is located in the center of the map. This room has some sponsorship opportunities as well, and there's a few banners around the room. On the right hand side of the screen, there's a square tile that says click to enter gallery. This is going to link out to the iPoster gallery. So if anyone on the call is a presenter and they're choosing to build their presentation in iPoster, it will be housed here in this gallery. When you're presenting live, you will share your screen to share your presentation. But if you are also utilizing iPoster, it will also be housed here for attendees to view at their leisure. The next pin I will show you going back down to the map. Rachel, is the, I, if I could just insert while we're here, the ARA iPresentation Gallery is uh, designed for uh, papers um, submitted and accepted in either paper sessions, uh, poster sessions, or roundtable sessions. Um, it is a location for your presentation and a dynamic web-based product. You can be located in the gallery, including if you have a paper in a symposia session, you can be located in the gallery and then pull up in a share screen modality when you're presenting. Uh, we have three, um, including one we did yesterday, we have three um, essentially um, workshops uh, on the uh, presentation gallery. We think it's a terrific product uh, for as many of you who choose to uh, do it, um, um, try it and use it. It's very user friendly, but I would advise you to turn to those uh, presentations uh, and to see the easy way in which you could do it. If you choose to do it, it's very user friendly. <laughs> And there's uh, and pretty intuitive within what I call the studio once you enter. But this will be the place that others will be able to view your interactive presentations. You will come here and click through. But if you are, when you are presenting live and all of the sessions are live for the meeting, um, uh, you will be able to um, show that presentation just as you might show another modality, let's say like PowerPoint. Um, so I just wanted to emphasize that there's more specific um, uh, videos just around that. And there's also a dedicated email uh, box at AERA. Uh, and all of the those with 
who are first authored, first listed authors for your papers should have received an invitation uh, to uh, create your presentation um, about three days ago. If you haven't received your invitation uh, and you are a presenting author or you have another question, um, we'll put the uh, uh, email in the Q&A, but it is uh, presentation-gallery at aera.net. Uh, I've seen some questions about, well, what's a paper session going to be like? A paper session is really going to be like you've experienced it live. And this virtual, this, this, as, uh, as Rachel will get to, this virtual environment enables you to do that uh, with a, uh, essentially with a one password sign on, not trying to figure out uh, which of those URLs you either saved or, uh, or forgot to say. Um, the other thing I want to mention is to use the Q&A function. Um, uh, we're monitoring that. We're trying to answer questions uh, from a number on staff, but we're also trying to extract salient questions from the Q&A that everybody might, might be interested in and that we'll try to take up live today or inform fact sheets. But let me turn it back to you, Rachel. Thank you, Felice. So on the screen, I have the map back open and I'm going to show you all one more pin before we jump into what the live sessions will look like. The next one we'll show you is the exhibit hall, which is to the left of the presentation gallery pin. Entering this room is going to bring you to a screen that allows you to click into the exhibitor directory. It's a blue tile in the middle of the screen. On the day of the event, this window is going to be populated with several tiles. Each tile will represent a different company's booth. Clicking into the booth is going to allow you to view the content that that company has chosen to share for this conference in the form of posters and videos. And you will have the opportunity to communicate with the exhibitor staff through the same chat feature that we went over at the beginning of this call. We'll now show you what a live session setting is going to look like. There's going to be two different formats we go over and they will be used across all types of sessions for this conference. So going down to the map, I will click into the virtual session room pin, which is in the center of the map. There's the ability to click into a live session through this pin, or you can continue to use the top toolbar that we went over in the beginning as well by clicking today's events. It will take you to the same screen. The first type of session is an example of what the paper or poster session will feel like. So we will click on the blue play button next to the session we want to enter. This type of session is going to be a more interactive session feel. Everyone will have the ability to turn on their microphone and camera in this room. So we encourage a lot of interaction. You will be able to type in the way you want your name to be displayed at the bottom of the screen. And then there's a blue icon that says join meeting. You have the option to turn your microphone and camera on and off. And you can see on the screen here that I'm joined by a couple of my colleagues to give you an example of what the screen is going to look like with multiple people on camera. You also have a text chat conversation option in the bottom left corner that will open up a box for you to type comments in and chat this way if you choose not to be on mic. There's also an icon next to that chat icon still in the bottom left corner. It looks like a computer monitor screen with an arrow. And this is how you as a presenter will share your screen. When you click on this, if you have multiple browsers, it will prompt you to choose which screen or specific window you want to share. And this is how presenters will share their content in every session by sharing their screen, whether it be a PowerPoint you're sharing, a browser page on your computer, 
an eye poster that you built, you will be sharing your screen to share your presentation. And Mackenzie will be able to give an example of sharing her screen so you as an attendee can see what that would look like from your perspective. If you're curious to see who's in the session, you have the ability to do that as well. In the bottom right corner, there are three dots and there's a few options that will appear. The one you will want to click on is speaker stats and that will list everybody in that session currently. So right now, Mackenzie has shared a screen. She chose to share a PowerPoint presentation. So the slide is full screen. She's still able to be on video if she wants to also be present while she's sharing. And if you wanted to change your view to go back to being tiled view, you as the individual attendee have the option to change your particular setting. So if you'd rather see everyone in an equal size display, you have that option, or you can click on a particular screen to make it expanded. If you're in a session that specifically has breakouts or smaller subsessions, in the top toolbar, there's an icon that reads breakouts. And all the breakouts listed here are going to specifically relate to the session you're in. So if at any time the presenter says, let's break out into smaller groups, you'll click on that breakout icon and click the blue play button of the room that you would like to move into. So that is an example of one format of the live sessions. And I'm now going to leave this session by clicking the red icon in the bottom middle of my screen. And we'll go back into the today's events window. From here, we'll click into a different session, still by clicking the blue play button. And the session that we're going into now is going to be a little bit different in how it appears, but the same functionality will exist. This session format, um, attendees do not automatically have access to their microphone and camera, but you can be granted permission to turn your microphone and camera on if the presenter chooses to share that with you. The first thing we'll do when we get in this session is go into the top toolbar and towards the right-hand side, click full screen. In the bottom right corner, there's a blue button that says chat. So from an attendee perspective, you will be able to engage in the public chat, which is everyone included in that session or if you click on the private tab in the panel on the right-hand side, you'll see everybody's name in that session listed. If you'd like to send them a private message, you can do so by clicking on their name. If you would like to go and participate in the session as an attendee by turning on your microphone and camera, you will have to request access using the chat and the presenter in that session can grant you access to your microphone. When you receive access to your microphone and camera, there will be additional icons that appear in the top of your screen. So Asia and Mackenzie will do that now and you'll see that my view slightly changed. I now have more icons available to me and all I have to do is click on the icons of the camera and the microphone to turn them on here. So if you choose to come on camera or microphone, you just have to request permission from the audience perspective. If you're in the presenter role, you will be able to locate everybody and turn on their microphone and camera for them if you choose to allow that in your session. If you are a presenter in this type of session, you will be sharing your screen just as you would in the example prior to this one. There's an icon in the top towards the right-hand side that says screen. It has an icon that looks like a computer monitor and you will be prompted in the same way to select which screen you want to share. Or again, if you want to choose just a specific application window, you have that option as well. You can still stay on camera during your presentation while you're sharing content on your screen, if that's something you would like to do. And, and that's essentially uh, how you would bring up uh, your interactive presentation, PowerPoints, if you've got some old transparencies around and want to show that too, go for it. 
Exactly. So I'll pause here now and see if there's any questions specific to the content we showed. I know we showed a lot of you a few different features. So whether you have a question related to the platform or what it looks like in a live session, we'd be happy to answer your questions at this time. I see one general question uh, that I want to clarify. Um, Scarrett has, uh, or Rachel has described the capacity of um, presenters being able to um, activate others' mics and <laughs> microphones in the room. That role, uh, well, you, well, technically the capacity exists in any symposia paper session, uh, well, and in the large rooms, which is essentially the symposia, um, uh, where we expect quite a number, there will be a, um, uh, as we have today, there will be a, um, a Q&A facilitator to handle the, the questions that come up and the chair will be, um, uh, will be the, uh, uh, the person, as is true in a live session, who will, uh, who can either turn to the Q&A moderator if there's a large turnout or will activate and call upon microphones. You can only imagine that each presenter, it could really get the timing off of a session, even though the power exists, uh, that will be a role executed by the chair, whether that is a, um, a very large or let's say over 100 symposia or even in a paper session, that is the traditional role of the chair. And that question was raised, could everyone do it? Well, hypothetically, anyone on uh, anyone who's brought in as uh, in any role has that functionality, but operationally there's the team leader of every session is the chair and they will, uh, they will execute that function, um, uh, both for timing and pace between presentations as well as you know, to create the kind of dynamic of interaction without, uh, without each person being able to uh, control individually uh, the questions that might be asked. I just, I saw that at least twice in the Q and A and I, um, I think this is a wonderful example where the technology is open for us to adapt in ways that fits the, uh, the, the, the form and structure of the meeting. Hi, a number of people are asking when they will be able to access the platform and whether they will have an opportunity to practice. Okay, that's a great question. We're aiming to have the platform open in early April. The email that you receive with your login credentials will specifically state what date you're able to log in. And if the practice question was from the side of a presenter, we are working on setting up some sessions that will allow you to click in and practice in. So we will send out more information once that is organized. And no, no though about it, that is that is what we wanna be able to offer to you. And, and Scarrett's really been working hard in um, with as many attendees as we have presenting in one mode or another to make it a meaningful experience. I wanna underscore though, when you are presenting, it will, your experience will be the equivalent of what you've already been doing in virtual space, uh, whether it is Zoom or, Power, or uh, WebEx or one of the other, GoToMeeting or one of the other. The beauty of this is A, no, there's no software on your, on your platform and there's nothing you have to grope around looking for anywhere to get to where you want to go. You go into the schedule, it's in your schedule, you, you hit a session and you are there. Uh, we're working on some um, specifics around that, but we ask everyone to arrive 10 minutes early as we did today to check lights and microphone, etc. You have the same screen, uh, screen sharing capacity. And so while we know there's an interest in actually coming to the platform and we want, we will be opening, I think by April 2nd is the day that we're opening for certain kinds of functions because we want you to go in and 
look at your contact sheet and, and see if, well, if you want to add pronouns uh, where you didn't do it in registration or you want to uh, add some other specifics so that persons can search and find you. And we want you also to be able to go to the interactive presentation gallery uh, to begin seeing the work for those who choose to use that modality. It's like going to a library and being able to see uh, presentations and say, oh, I'd like to go to that one live. So we'll open some features um, uh, early, uh, but it is, uh, I suppose I said to myself, you know, when, I, when the ARA staff arrives two days or three days early, and let's say I or others on the staff who are members of the research community know we're making a presentation, and I go up to the room that all of my colleagues in that session can't get access to. For me too, that room is locked. And if I'm doing something more significant or not, you know, it's, uh, so I think you're gonna experience this as far less of a locked room because uh, we're, we're, we're showing it in a, in, a, in a way that I hope is accessible. And the, and, and the Scarrett group is working on, um, uh, on demonstrations. But when you, when you think about practicing, when I'm practicing before a WebEx um, or before a Zoom, I just invite myself and I practice. You all can do that. It's not gonna feel different. It's gonna feel exactly like that, except the tools are at your bottom left, the share screen's a little bit different, but we will have pictures already of all of that functionality on the, uh, as part of the training that's, I think a lot of it's already available on our website. Tony, do you have? Yeah, a number of people are also asking how a round table session will work in the platform. Yeah, I always love, and we're gonna put up the, uh, some of the screenshots because it, uh, the screenshots of uh, when you're on the map and you go to sessions and then um, you will uh, essentially for a round table uh, for those who arrive early who aren't presenters, you're going to see, I will say an oval table and not a round table. That's the visualization of it. Okay, uh, I think that actually is it. And so you will be uh, waiting if, if it's not, let's say you arrive at 10.15 because you, you just arrived early and you're an attendee, you will be um, seeing that and, and waiting to come in for a 10.40 session. Those who are, um, um, in the disc those who have papers at the round table, which has a chair and three to five, now go back to the other. This is a, uh, this is a paper, the second was a paper session. Uh, this is the round table. So um, when the chair and the three to five uh, papers, which could have more than one person designated as presenter, um, you will come 10 minutes early, you will be essentially um, squares <laughs> uh, within, um, within the framing. The framing itself will continue to suggest a round table, but as you go live, it will go full screen as much as the attendee wishes. Now, many of you have asked, well, what's it gonna be like? It's gonna be like a round table. A round table is not a paper session where you are making a formal presentation of your work. Typically at a round table, uh, the motif is uh, uh, those, uh, uh, if you haven't shared your uh, papers uh, with each other in advance, which I strongly encourage you to do, the chair has access to the papers, that each of you might speak in a kind of a lightning to each other. Well, you know, let me just kind of highlight in advance uh, what my paper was about. Uh, the, you know, the, you have some common topic that typically we've been group, you've been grouped around. You'll be saying briefly what the paper is about, the essence of what you found, maybe what you're agonizing about at the moment, or seeing as an opportunity that you would like to discuss with your colleagues who have similarly situated, at least topical or methodological or theoretical interest. That conversation will unfold, but everyone who has joined that room will actually be just like, um, uh, just like at a round table, they'll be sitting, I won't say that you won't see the table at that point, 
but the assuming it's a small group, the chair can, of course, it's expected there that the mics will be fully open and the chair can call upon you. It tends to be led, of course, by the paper presenters and then the chair or others chime in. If it's a small group, let's say uh, only another six or eight attending, um, all the videos can be on just like, uh, uh, just like a meeting mode in Zoom versus a, a webinar. And the other screenshot that um, uh, Rachel showed, that's what a paper session is going to look like. And I'm going to say, hopefully that looks familiar. <laughs> that looks like a theater style small room. And uh, we anticipate mics will be up in that. And that, uh, that we ask, you know, just as we ask uh, for paper presentations, you're not reading your paper because people can otherwise read it. You're synthesizing the essence of it in Typically, even if you're sharing with a presenter, you know, you typically are allocated eight to 10 minutes. We hope all chairs communicate. They've already gotten letters. That is our standard letter since 2010 about the chair role and communicating with uh, paper presenters. So uh, I hope that answers. We're getting that question quite a bit around roundtables. Uh, I, I don't want to say oddly, but maybe uniquely. And we want to assure you that other than having multiple tables in one room, essentially you have your place for your round table without the echoes, <laughs> noise, scurrying around. Someone who's an attendee, if they wanted to see two concurrents, they can leave yours and go to another. And, and, and we've tried to really re recreate something quite familiar to you. Thank you, Felice. One thing to add to that, um, as Rachel's demonstrating here on the screen, so um, the round tables, paper session, poster sessions, excuse me, um, those will function in the platform that we are showing now. But as Felice mentioned, when you enter the room, you're going to see a graphic that more um, closely resembles how that would feel in person. But this is the platform that you will use for a round table. So it can be very engaging. Um, everybody can be on camera. You can use chat. You can screen share. Multiple people can screen share. Um, if they have something they want to see. Um, so this is kind of simulating a smaller, more intimate group and gathering. So this is the platform that roundtables will use specifically, but you'll have a graphic that gives you more of the feel um, that you're at a table versus, um, you know, maybe in a, in a poster session or at a paper okay. session. And all three of those, thank you, Asia, for underscoring that. And that's actually the beauty of, of one of the many beauties of this platform is that um, that small group interaction more typical of a round table or of a uh, paper session. Paper sessions are not, you know, can grow in size, but they're not, they're not symposia of 250 persons in the same room. And you saw that larger theater space. Uh, so there are medium and large rooms that, that will rely more on Q and A um, and the uh, chair. Um, um, calling upon persons during a Q and A period. I'll turn this back to let. Uh, we'll turn it back to Rachel, uh, unless Tony, you see something that we should stop and address right now. Um, well, someone has asked if you could share similar information for panel presentations. The panel presentation, the paper sessions, or the symposia. I think we did. Was well, it? Um, the paper sessions were, was that small theater room <laughs> and, and that will operate just like a paper session. It, the chair will introduce it, set the framing, and we'll be calling upon each, uh, um, each paper that has typically one presenter, sometimes two are sharing. Um, uh, the chair determines typically with the paper presenters whether to hold all questions until the end or whether to intersperse questions as now we are uh, occasionally doing. And that, just like in the place-based meeting, that degree of flexibility, recognizing that we want to be sure that the last paper presenter has quality time, uh, that, uh, that uh, session uh, will unfold. Symposia take very different forms and tend to be 
larger uh, sessions. Sometimes there are papers given at symposia and the chair organizer and you all should communicate just as you do before a place-based meeting, kind of what, what's gonna be the format. If it's a town hall meeting format that let's say we use for some of our town halls on, um, uh, uh, we've done several on violence in the schools or sexual harassment, then the presenters, we do kind of quick uh, uh, lightning talks where each presenter gets two or three minutes to get their perspective or their concerns or their issues on the table. And then, then there's a interaction across the uh, presenters bringing the audience into that town hall environment with, um, uh, and that can unfold exactly like that. So how the session submissions, whether invited or uh, accepted under the open submission unfold, this environment, um, which you saw by looking at that big theater screen, that's adaptable to however, um, the uh, the organizer and chair when you were invited in an invited session to be part of it or a submitted session, they have various different sort of motifs. I mean, we even have some, you know, live demonstrations and some, but the typical one is uh, sort of, I guess the word panel crept in, um, is a panel of presenters and typically that is allocated either a short amount of time to get the issues on the table or you are already expecting, having been part of a, a session submission, having some sense uh, and the abstracts that are already online convey some sense of uh, the, preferred, um, the preferred format. We definitely have already encouraged all chairs of any session um, to communicate with those in that session about how you want it to unfold. And this uh, motif and this technology and this platform is uh, has that flexibility uh, around how you would prefer to hold it. All right, I'm gonna turn it back to Rachel. Tony, are there any other questions we can answer right now? Yeah, a, um, a couple people have asked how breakout rooms during a session would work. Sure. So no matter what type of session you're in, in the two different methods we showed today, it's going to be in the same location. So I'll click into one of these sessions so I can show you the example and I'll share my screen once more. So when you're in a session, no matter what the format is, you're going to click in the top toolbar. There's going to be a word that says breakouts. And from this middle screen that appears on your computer, there's going to be all the breakouts listed for that particular session that you are in. And you can choose from the breakouts listed which one you want to move into by clicking the blue play button next to each title. Any other questions at this time, Tony? Uh, I'll share one more, which is how is a session host determined? So a session host is actually going, all the presenters are going to be, whether you're the author, presenter, chair, discussant, if you need to automatically have access to your microphone and camera, you will be in the same role. So you're able to access turning it on and off, sharing your screen if you're the presenter to share content. So all of that is actually going to be pulled through all academics. So as long as your name is listed as a chair, discussant, presenter, someone that needs access to their microphone and camera, you will automatically join your session with those rights, we call it, or permission to be able to do what you need in those sessions. 
I hope that answers your question. And Rachel, if I can just add in, this is Mackenzie speaking on the spirit group. The host is actually going to be technical staff. So it will be someone who's in the session to assist you. Um, all of the presenters will be in the, that presenter role that Rachel showed. And only the chair will have the capacity just so that someone doesn't hit the wrong button. Only the substantive chair of the session, in the case of the poster session, it would be the, uh, the authors uh, since those sessions aren't shared, but they're um, uh, implemented by the, you know, by the, by the, uh, by the authors. Um, the chair of the session, as we think of the chair in all academic, um, that is that that individual will have um, the unique opportunity to uh, uh, to end a session. The sessions will automatically end by, as Mackenzie just implied, by the um, by the technical staff. They will begin on time and end on time. There's no sort of hanging on stage while uh, people are waiting in the woodwork. But uh, the system would give. We don't want anyone to hit a button inadvertently that ends the session. And so um, uh, the chair, the substantive chair will have that unique, I suppose, authority. Um, we don't expect that, that there's any reason to use it, but it, that won't be equally distributed. You will be able to share screen. You will have control over your mic, your video. Uh, you technically could call upon others to ask questions, but that, you know, that wouldn't be very, um, mutually supportive. If one person could call upon everyone to ask questions when three people haven't presented their paper yet. So the chair will operate in that, um, I say, uh, supra role. Thank you. Thank you, Felice. And one other thing that I would like to add, um, I have seen quite a few questions and comments and maybe Robert and Felice, you can clarify this for uh, the group as well. Um, breakouts do need to be pre-arranged. So if you are chairing a session or presenting in a session and you um, need to use breakouts, it will not um, be the case that you can just go and say, oh, I need 10 breakout rooms and the, the system will automatically generate that. They do need to be pre-arranged. So Felice and Robert, I'm not sure if you wanna talk about that process, but there was quite a few questions that came in um, regarding how do they make sure that they've communicated that they need breakouts to you. The session chairs can send an email to the uh, AERA annual meeting mailbox, and we will put that email address in the chat and just let us know how many breakouts uh, you need for your session. Let, let me emphasize that all that information was already submitted, and it, usually this is a yin and yang and and, and uh, between uh, Robert and I, where I'm the one who says, just tell us. We have had to, we've had to base what we have done in the design of this meeting upon what was asked. And we have designed all of our requests around that. Uh, this is, you're, you are well into the spontaneous period, meaning we have spent many, many hours working with what was submitted by program chairs what was submitted in the original request. We are only talking about maybe being able to do this for a handful of sessions where there might have been a bit of forgetfulness. And if a SIG chair uh, or division VP needs a little latitude, two things have to happen. We really need to know by Monday or Tuesday of this week. And we need to be sure that it's a session time where we have open slots because uh, we spent quite a bit of time. We added a little flexibility, but if the 200 and X persons with us or 300 persons with us right now think that this is special request time, I, I sadly say any more than if we were uh, at a convention center and you wanted three breakout rooms uh, three weeks before the annual meeting, chances are we couldn't do that as, as as warmly as we feel about all of those requests. There are, there's a time you run out of rooms and we are pretty much at that time. So only immediate special requests will have to consider 
how we can do it. And this isn't like it would be just great to have them. It, it's uh, we've been we plan this around the way the request was submitted uh, in November, and 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 that's the way the meeting has to unfold. So uh, use this um, request function very judiciously, and be sure it's ones that uh, are also advanced by the SIG chair and the division VP. I, I, one of the things we might say is something about the receptions though, that actually have this great opportunity to go to banquet tables together and hang out with uh, old and new friends and colleagues. Rachel, were you planning to cover the, the informal dimensions or the business meetings and uh, break, uh, the business meetings and uh, essentially reception experience? Um, not specifically, Asia, is there any information we can add to what we have shown about the business meetings and receptions? Did you show the environment that even though it has the same functionality as a structured round table, there's a... Um... Right, so um, for the receptions, uh, you would start out in maybe a larger gathering. Um, so maybe if you would liken that to a larger ballroom. Uh, and then there will be tables and those are basically gonna be small breakout rooms. So you'll be able to go to the top menu and select um, the drop down and kind of move through the tables. There might be a lot of action happening in one and maybe you wanna, you wanna bounce around. Um, so you'll have that uh, opportunity to move around and network through smaller tables, um, much exactly the functionality that we displayed in a round table, you know, you might have up to 25 people on camera that are all talking. You might be able to share something. Um, you can click to who you'd like to see larger on the camera. Um, so you'll have all of those same functionalities in uh, a reception as well. So some of, some of the units are, are gonna have game tables. <laughs> uh, I saw one SIG was uh, uh, sent out a survey this morning to its membership to I think also get some feedback and interest in fun things. Uh, there'll be this essentially, it'll look like, uh, you know, that just what we saw, it looked like a schedule and you can hop around tables. There are some groups that are kind of large so that they might have 15 for the first 20 minutes and then 15 tables on a different set of either topics or issues. Some groups might just have open tables and some groups might just have hosted open tables, but that's part of that kind of social rapport and exchange that, you know, that when you saw the, uh, the structured poster sessions or the structured round tables, it'll operate the same, but, um, uh, but it has a different touch and feel. Correct. Thank you, Felice. Um, so I think we have come to I don't see any other questions um, regarding the platform. So Felice, I think we might be able to turn it over to Emily. Um, oh. <laughs> and a few more questions are coming in. Uh, right. So a symposium will not operate the same way that a round table would. Um, that's going to be done in the more, the larger format where only the, the chair and the presenters will have access to their camera. Um, so that'll be the last question um, that I think we can take. Uh, today, um, Elise, I think if you want to turn it over to Emily, we might want to uh, allow some time for that part of the, the program today. Absolutely. So, uh, and then uh, we'll just open it again for general questions. Uh, we still have some time after Emily kind of underscores the importance of uh, uh, disability access provisions, access provisions more generally, both for presenters or participants in a session, as well as for attendees, um, and then we'll you know open it back up for uh, other uh, questions or topics or things we should be thinking about to make our meeting as uh, inclusive and responsive to we where you are uh, and to for your enjoyment as well as uh, intellectual and scholarly and research success as as we possibly can. Emily, hello everybody. I'm going to share my screen. 
My name is Emily Badix. Um, I am sitting in front of a bookshelf right now. I'm a white woman with curly hair and some hoop earrings on. Um, I am presenting about access at AERA. And if you've been to one of these other trainings or conversations, um, you've seen me talk about uh, this already, and that might be getting a little bit repetitive, but that's also a very exciting thing because it's part of our goal to just make sure that we're thinking about access all the time leading up to this conference. Um, I am the Associate Director at the Longmore Institute on Disability. And I've been brought in for the short term to help access to, uh, AERA promote access at the conference. I want to say thank you to the Disability Studies in Education Special Interest Group um, because um, on, in addition to their academic charge, they have done a lot of work historically with AERA fighting and, and promoting access. And so I, I appreciate the work that they've done that sets up um, the work that I'm now doing and, and also for many of the members who have uh, shared support and ideas. So first and foremost, we need to be thinking about access at this conference for our colleagues with disabilities. Um, but I also think when we are adapting to the virtual realm, one of the things that we've seen at, at our many events is how many people are benefiting from the principles of access, access and accessible design. Um, I have an image on the slide right now that says access won't just benefit people with disabilities, the curb cut effect. There's an image of a curb cut sidewalk and you know, which is something that's built into the environment, primarily thinking about wheelchair riders. And what we have of course discovered over the year is that years is that many, many people benefit from this, from um, parents who are pushing strollers, like there's a woman in the photo on the uh, slide, um, to skateboarders and bicycle riders and travelers with rolly suitcases. Um, I think that it's gonna work the exact same way, bringing access to a virtual conference. Um, I know already some of the things that I've participated in as a sighted person that have audio description for the blind and vision impaired means that I can walk away from my computer for a second and not feel left out of what's going on. Um, I know I've had moments where sound cuts out for me on, as an individual user and thanks to captioning, I still have access. So I, again, I hope that um, you're also seeing this as an opportunity for ben things that will benefit you, whether you have a disability uh, or don't. This is briefly um, AERA's access plan amongst many other things that there are um, conversations that are happening and that they're working on. They've thought about pacing to set up so that, you know, it's not overly rushed. There's breaks in the days to sort of take care of attendees, bodies, and minds because conferences are exhausting work. The platform is screen reader accessible. ASL interpreters will be easily visible. There's nothing you have to do to make them visible. Um, ASL live and, li and live captioning will be provided for all plenaries, symposia, lectures, business meetings, and receptions. Um, art of AI captions, um, which has taken, you know, big progress lately, um, but it's still just not going to be quite the quality of a live uh, um, captioner um, and certainly not uh, interpreting. Um, uh, so AI captioning will be provided at poster sessions, paper sessions, roundtable sessions, and banquet tables as the default. However, if you want... Um, if you know you're going to a poster, one of these sessions that is gonna have AI captioning and you would like to see an ASL interpreter and or a captioner, you can go ahead and make that request. And on my final slide, I'll give the email address that you can make these requests to. Um, you also, you know, we thought as well about some of those impromptu things that might happen, the networking or some of your panelists all wanna get together and, and touch base beforehand. And so there's gonna be some last minute floaters that are ASL interpreters and captioners that can be pulled in. Obviously this is an unlim unlimited number, you know, hopefully uh, they'll be available if you need it, but that's another resource. And you could just go to the AER help desk in the conference center to access that. Papers are due by March 25th, and that's gonna help ASL and captioners review the key terms and prepare for their um, work. 
There is recorded narration for eye presentation in uh, the gallery that will also have a transcript provided to provide another layer of access. All eye presentations, PowerPoints, and multimedia must be accessible. And if you are a presenter and chair, um, please make sure to check out whether it whether you watch one of the videos of the past trainings we did or the guidelines for access um, uh, tips and handouts that are coming out soon to help make that possible so that you think about making sure your presentation um, or the way you are chairing a session is uh, you know really welcoming these access principles because the goal of course is to get your audience as big as possible. Um, the videos will be available after the live program to allow people to experience the conference program at their own pace, making space for crypt time. And, um, and that's another feature that will help more people be able to learn from all that uh, your presentations have to offer. And uh, there is access support during the conference and ombuds available as well. But this is just a few things. This is just the start of, of a long process. You know, 100% access is never possible because there's competing accommodations. You might bring access for one group and in exchange, another group now has a barrier. It, it's messy, ongoing work. It's creative and, and wonderful and exciting work. Um, and so, uh, you know, there are many opportunities for more ahead. What you can do. Please follow the guidelines for accessible presentations. Um, check your assumptions as you interact with your colleagues. You know, don't sort of assume that video chat is going to be the best way for folks to interact because uh, if somebody's deaf or hard of hearing, they may prefer for it to be a text chat. Um, just sort of, you know, operate in a way where you, you realize you don't know. You don't know if somebody has video off. Don't make uh, because they're lying in bed and that's the way that they can participate in this conference. Just really push yourself to not make assumptions about what anybody is uh, experiencing at this moment. Um, help out AI captioning. If you see that um, AI captioning is, you know, kind of repeatedly uh, getting some keyword wrong, you can just use the public chat and write, hey, I noticed that the AI is saying um, CADA, Q-A-E-D-A, -E when it should be CADA, C-A-D-A. That'll help somebody know, oh, okay, got it. <laughs> Um, and that's just a really great way that you can participate in the access process. Avoid ableist language. We're not just trying to build in access barrier or remove barriers and provide access features, but also really shift to a culture of inclusion. And when you use language like so-and-so is blind to the fact, or you drop the word crazy, or those sorts of things can be really hurtful and um, uh, hurt the progress of, of developing that inclusive culture. Attendees without disabilities advocate for access. If you notice that you know access that nobody's providing audio description of slides for the blind or vision impaired, or that a ASL interpreter isn't present in a session where they're supposed to be present, don't leave that up to your disabled colleagues to have to always be the ones to fight for access. You can support by saying, "I have noticed that the session is not currently accessible. What what can we do about this?" And um, attendees with disabilities, um, please help AERA learn by sharing your experiences. Uh, I think there is going to be considerable progress this year that happens for access, but certainly it is always a process of evolution and growth. And so um, there will be you know, important opportunities to learn from this year's conference and continue to grow and build in really exciting ways. So if you have any access concerns, again, this is not tech access unless it's disability related, um, please feel free to reach out to access at aera.net. Once again, that's access at aera.net. That's where you can make your requests if you need AASL and captioning for any of those sessions that are going to rely, rely on AI. Um, if you are a... Um, blind or low vision presenter that's having a hard time with the eye presentation perhaps or something, you know, feel free to reach out and you can get a little bit more support there. Thank you so much. I look forward to learning from you all and hopefully things are going well. Take care. Well, we have some time. Robert, you, would you join me please? Um, for those of you who saw the agenda, um, you know, you never can absolutely re-record a live event in my eagerness to uh, move to our Scarrett presentation and be sure that you had an opportunity to see this virtual environment. 
I did not introduce my longstanding collaborator and actually our team leader for all events that we do, not just the annual meeting. So Robert's been uh, an instrumental innovator uh, at, a at uh, ARA and actually my first hire at ARA. Uh, and so we've got, we have a lot of fun doing this for you and with you. And we are open to any questions, um, opportunities, things that you wish or don't yet have an answer to that you might like. And our colleagues in the Scarrett group and Emily too uh, are available to be part of this conversation. And then Robert's gonna close us out with words of wisdom. Actually, I, I have a word of wisdom for our attendees right now. When, if you have not registered, please do, but also please register with the same email address that you submitted your paper with uh, so that they sync up both within the all academic system and Expo Logic, and ultimately with the Skerritt Group. Yeah, and and uh, when there was mention made of the um, March twenty fifth deadline for uploading your papers, of course, everyone with a paper submission, um, you have a paper there. So uh, for some of you, your first submission is your final submission. That kind of varies by subfield traditions with our, uh, in, in our field and in every field. But if you are aiming to do and upload a, uh, uh, a, we'll call it a final presentation paper, and what is there is not what you would consider to be your final annual meeting uh, paper, the deadline for that is um, March 25th. The deadline for all presenting authors is also March 25th to register. You need to be registered uh, in order to be a presenting author. You actually need to be registered to come to the island. You know, you get a ticket to the island and you get in and it's one-stop shopping, but you need to be registered. But that deadline can be, if you're not presenting at all and you're just attending the meeting, you can do that. You know, we like, we, we, there's advantages to doing it early because you'll be able to um, fill out your contact sheet, go to your, we have office space, you go to your own office, you'll be able to go to the interactive presentation gallery, there'll be some demonstration opportunities, but, um, but if you are a presenting author, uh, you need uh, um, every, every paper has to have one presenting author registered. If a paper doesn't have a presenting author registered after the 25th, that paper will, will be removed from the program, uh, just as it would have been done in any um, other year. And just as council, ARA council emphasized, we needed to pay attention to as a collective community so that people would show up to sessions and and we would and it's not it's not really wholesome to have a something scheduled and then and then the and then no presenter um, uh, uh, comes to the meeting. So that that's that is the deadline, and and we encourage you to do so. Um, symposia are uh, that are submitted or session submissions that have papers tend only to have an abs well only have an abstract in the system at the point of um, submission, uh, in this case, it was in July. The, for those who have been to many ARA annual meetings or maybe one other where you were part of a symposia, um, if your symposia is such that, you, that, that it is a symposia with underlying papers, you are expected to, which is in the call, the original call, to upload for, for the first time, because you didn't have a paper in the system during the session submission, what is called a commentary paper. And uh, you could go back to the call, but it's a, it can, it's a brief of paper, but it has a beginning, a middle and an end, whether it's theoretical, methodological or empirical. And, uh, or it could be as I suppose, as long or short as you wish. Um, but if you are, if you are seeking to, um, well, not, that is the time, what, whatever commentary paper you've been working on to 
circulate to the chair and the discussant, that is the time to upload also uh, by the 20, uh, 25th of March, a commentary paper. All papers in symposia sessions can also um, be part of the interactive, interact, inter, uh, interactive presentation gallery with your presentation. We actually encourage it. It is difficult to tell with all of the different forms of symposia, which symposia have essentially commentary papers underlying them. If you look at the papers that were done on a just a experimental, I suppose, basis, we had 450 pace, uh, authors who from papers from their 2020 meeting that we invited in October, November, December, if they wish to do an interactive presentation uh, they could do so. Many actually came from symposia and many came from paper sessions, um, uh, uh, round tables or, or poster sessions, but we are not trying to make this benefit exclusive to paper submissions. We actually did not want to, um, to send invitations to those who would wonder why they got one because they're in a symposia uh, that might not have uh, underlying paper. Other questions? Tony, you see anything else that? I think we've addressed everything. Were there any big issues that we answered in writing that we that would be of general interest? Uh, uh, not just to the, because people aren't reading Q&A at the same time. Uh, Laurie, Nathan, is there anything that you see to be a, a big issue of general interest? I think everything's been addressed quite sufficiently. Okay. Well, um, I wanna thank everyone. I'm gonna toss it back to Robert in a moment, but I really wanna thank everyone who, uh, ha who has attended this, uh, quite a number, uh, and you've stuck with our orientation. We hope you have found it useful. Um, uh, our ASL colleagues, closed captioners, uh, Emily, the SCARA team. It is just, it is so gratifying to have a team that's pulling at the same kinds of objectives, not just as a matter of substance, but as a matter of culture and climate. And one of the best parts of being um, your executive director is I think this is more true of our research community uh, across hemispheres and across uh, continents um, than uh, many, many others of which we intersect and are part. And I'm really proud to be part of the team that's uh, um, bringing you the virtual annual meeting this year. And Robert's gonna tell us how many milliseconds before that. Robert, you wanna close us out? Uh -oh. We, thank you, Felice. We've got about 18 days until the start of the annual meeting. We look forward to having you all in the virtual platform and joining us uh, in this very unique way of delivering the AERA annual meeting. Uh, and with that, thank you. And if you've not registered, please do. And we look to f see you uh, that last part or of the first week of April, the, eight, the 9th to the 12th. 8th to the 12th. All right. Thanks All a right. lot, everybody. Thank you.